Welcome to the lecture on chapter 27. Here we're going to talk about active galaxies, as opposed to inactive galaxies, something called quasars, and more about black holes, but specifically the supermassive kind. Okay, so we're talking about deep space here. We're still talking about galaxies, like we were in the last, last chapter, okay? So we're, we're well past the Milky Way. We're going out to the edge of the seeable universe, the very edge of what astronomers can see with the best telescopes like the Hubble telescope. And speaking of the Hubble telescope, here we have a couple of what are called ultra deep field views. This is basically taking a really, really small part of the sky, about one one hundredth the, the size of the moon in its sky, in the sky, which itself is a tiny fraction of the overall, you know, viewable um, angular size of the sky, and resolving it very carefully over time with a space-based telescope, and seeing that in the visible spectrum there are a lot of galaxies in that tiny, tiny fraction of the sky, a testament to the fact that, based on calculations, there must be about a hundred billion galaxies. All right. So that is a visible ultra deep field view. What isn't discussed so much, because this is kind of a famous picture of this one here, is maybe taking that same image, but doing it instead with x-rays. Because when we take a similar ultra deep field view of the sky, tiny portion of the sky, we see lots of x-ray sources, lots of little spots that are emitting x-rays. What are those? Well, it turns out that those are quasars. Okay, one of the big topics of today's lecture. What is a quasar? Why does it? Why are there little black spots or little little spots in the sky? Not black, I suppose, but little white spots in the sky. You know, with art, this is artificially colored, right? Because I mean, X-rays are outside of the visible spectrum, so we're just you know giving them giving the different power X-rays different colors, kind of matching them up with the visible spectrum. But the point is, why why are there all these X-ray sources? How and how far away are they? Okay, so. If we look at a typical quasar, okay, whatever that is, okay, is it a star, right? If we look at a typical quasar, we can distinguish it from an ordinary star because it has a huge redshift, okay? So the kind of the first thing that sets a quasar apart from an ordinary star is its redshift. Kind of like we would, we would separate a pulsar from an ordinary star because it pulses. In other words, its luminosity varies dramatically over a very short time period of just a couple days. You know, so that, that's a key characteristic of a pulsar, I mean, and led to our understanding that pulsars must be neutron stars. So likewise, in the history of astronomy, you know, I think maybe over the last hundred years, understanding what is a quasar, part of the mystery would have then been furthered or maybe started to be solved by the fact that there is a big redshift measured. Because if the redshift is so large, if it's 67,000 miles, or corresponds to a velocity of 67,000 miles per hour, or per second, excuse me, moving away from us at such an incredibly great speed, that means, according to Hubble's law, these quasars must be very far away. So first of all, that means they're not stars, because there's no way, no way we're seeing something that is this luminous that is that far away and has such a big redshift. So they must be something more like galaxies, or maybe a part of a galaxy. Because there's no way that they could be that far away and be an individual star. Okay, so okay, so we got that out of the way. Quasars are not stars. Okay, but the name kind of implies that we, that astronomers weren't sure, right? Quasar definitely you know kind of evokes the idea of a star, just like pulsar does, right? But quasars are not stars. Okay, well, part of the mystery of quasars was starting to be really kind of revealed by a couple of astronomers here. Okay, pioneers in understanding quasars. All right, and one of the one of the images they took, part of the mystery of quasars. Here we see one looks like an ordinary star, but one thing I want to point out with this one, and what, that your textbook points out, is there is a tail. Okay, and we're going to talk about that. Okay, so there's a, there's a mis mysterious tail that's coming off the quasar, a jet. Okay, so qu that's so adding to the list of strange things about quasars, they are very redshifted, which means they're very far away, and some of them have jets, and maybe the ones that don't have jets have jets that just face us so we can't see them, okay? All right, and the thing about, about quasars is really, and what's so fascinating and what's fun to think about in terms of, of, their, of their discovery, is that they, it would be so easy to not realize what they are. Because we look here, these two sources of light, they both look like stars, but this one here is a star, but this one is a quasar. The star is in our galaxy, 
The quasar is, I, I mean, it's, it doesn't say here, but most quasars are well over 4 billion light years away. So we can say probably as a good estimate, it's going to be greater than 4 billion light years from Earth. Okay. Also from our galaxy, effectively, because our galaxy is only about 200,000 light years across. That's a tiny fraction of 4 billion, right? 200,000 is a much, much smaller number, much smaller than 4 billion. Okay. The nearest galaxy to us is 2 million. Well, 4 billion is, is 2,000 times greater than the closest galaxy, okay? The Andromeda galaxy. So this is an incredibly huge distance we're talking about. Quasar star. One in our galaxy, the other one way out, okay? But again, they look the same, right? And that right there, that, that tells us something remarkable. That means that quasars, to look this bright, to have these stellar-like qual qualities when we look at them with a basic telescope, that means that they must be incredible incredibly luminous because how else would the energy be able to travel such a great distance and look so bright, look so starlight? So, okay, now we got, they're really far away, they're really luminous, and they have tails. So what are they? What, what is going to resolve the mystery of the quasar? Okay? So looking here, we can see that quasars are part of galaxies. They're so bright that sometimes we don't even notice. They just look, they just look Obviously, like a star, they look like a single point source of light. We even saw that with the X-ray image. The X-ray the sources, which, by the way, were quasars, they just look like little point sources, right? But with very careful photographing in order to get, you know, take in the much less intense light from the, the rest of the galaxy. And remember, the rest of the galaxy is 100 billions of stars. That's a lot of light, but it turns out being much less light than the quasar. We can see that the quasar, although washing out the middle of the galaxy, is clearly part of a spiral galaxy here. So we can see that quasars are part of galaxies. Same thing shown here, it's a little bit blurrier in that example. We can see that quasars are also part of galaxies that collide. Here we can clearly see a couple of spiral galaxies colliding, both having a ultra bright quasar at its center. All right. And then we can even, we can see that quasars can clearly have tails. Look here, we can clearly see that this is not elliptical shape of a galaxy nor is it a, a typical shape of a spiral galaxy. This is actually the tail of the quasar. And here we can see here the tail that's coming off of the quasar, okay? So now here, this one's a little tricky, but I, I, think, you, I think you can understand this. Additionally, we can, based on a very simple set of data, show that quasars must be very small. Because you look here, you might say, oh, well, the quasar maybe is almost the size of the galaxy, right? It's so bright. Maybe, you know, maybe it takes up a good third of the galaxy, right? If you were just to look at this image and say, okay, well, you know, this is, this is the galaxy diameter. Well, the quasar has, you know, a diameter. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's a third of the overall diameter. We'll take a diameter like, like the Milky Way, say it's 100,000 light years. That means that the quasar itself maybe is this, this giant cluster of stars, maybe, that's 30,000 light years across. That seems reasonable, right? It's just a, maybe a really dense cluster of stars, okay? But turns out that's not the case because a lot of quasars will vary in intensity so the actual light coming from the quasar will vary up and down on the scale of months or days, okay? So we can say that they vary in intensity on time scale of months or days, okay? So if that's the case, then think, think about this. That actually tells us the size. Because one of the big things, and it's a big idea in physics, physics and astronomy that's, that's difficult to wrap your mind around at first, but then it, it, it then becomes a wonderful kind of just like foundational idea. And that's that light has a fixed speed, okay? In a vacuum, light only travels at the speed of light. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, I know that, right? But the consequences are so important. So it's 300 million meters per second. It's fast, right? But it can't travel faster. So that means that when we, you know, when we look at distant stars, we're looking back in time, maybe just a few years or maybe a few thousand years, right? When we look at different galaxies, we're looking back at least 2 million years in time because the closest galaxy is 2 million light years away, which means the light took 2 million light years to get to us. But well, why am I bringing it up? What does that have to do with the size of a quasar? Well, if we have a variation that happens on the time scale of month or, months or days, that means the size of the quasar can't be bigger than a light day or a light month, depending on what the variation is. So if we have a variation that is one light month, so we have a quasar that gets brighter and dimmer once every, once every month, okay? That means that its size must be one light month, okay? So then the size is at a minimum 
okay, excuse me, maximum, it's the maximum size, uh, one light month, okay? And if you're not uh, used to, you know, referring to distances like that, that's like a light year, right? So a light year is how long it takes or how far light travels in one year, okay? So one light year is a distance. I know, you know it sounds like time, right? But it's a distance. It's how far light travels in one year. The closest star to Earth is four light years away. It takes light four years to travel from Alpha Proxima to Earth, okay? Um, on the other hand, it takes about an hour for light to travel to, you know, kind of the edge, the edge of the solar system, all right? In fact, um, to get to Pluto, let me have, let me look at the value here. It's mentioned in your textbook. Um, let's see, so I think it's like, is it 55, oh, 5.5 light hours, okay? So light from the sun to Pluto, so you know, we think kind of the edge of the solar system, not quite there, there's actually a lot of things past Pluto, the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud, but you know, the really kind of the planetary edge of the solar system, Pluto, 5.5 light hours, okay? Now we don't see quasars that fluctuate on the scale of hours, because they're not pulsars, but they're not within our own solar system, these are, excuse me, our own galaxy, these are much further away, but we do see them fluctuating on, a lot of them on the scale of months. So that means that quasars must have a size, so I say this is your quasar, it must have a size that is no smaller and no bigger really, right? This is its size of, I keep saying small, I really mean its maximum size is one light month, okay? So that's quite small, okay? You might be like, well, I mean, come on, it, you know, Pluto's really far away and it only takes six hours, you know, to get there, right? You know, so a light month, that's actually pretty big. But think about the nearest star to us. That's four light years away. So a light month is bigger than a solar system, but smaller than the distance between stars. So it's kind of an intermediate size, okay? And some of them, the ones that do fluctuate on days, means that the size of the quasar must be approximately the size of the solar system, okay? So it must be, you know, not the Pluto solar system, but the very edge of the solar system, out where, you know, where the distant comets are located, you know, the ones that occasionally fall in towards the sun. So, you know, kind of the, the, the broad concept of the solar system, of our, our solar system. So that's dramatically small. And by the way, this figure, which I haven't talked about very much, is just explaining the idea. And look this up in the textbook, that if, if you have a source that, or a, a, a light source that varies, that variation must be equal to the size of the source, okay? So in this case, the, you know, the variation here would be 10 light years because the source is 10 light years across. So that means that any fluctuation from this cluster of stars that is a total of 10 light years across would be on the time scale of 10 light years, okay? We couldn't perceive fluctuations that are faster because the object is too big, okay? So the only way that we can perceive fluctuations in quasars that are on the scale of months or days is because the quasar itself is that small, okay? Because of that maximum speed of light, of information, because light is information, okay? So I, I know I spent a while on this, but it's a tricky concept, okay? But that adds to our list. And perhaps that's the most remarkable thing about quasars because they're incredibly bright. But now we're seeing that they only take up the space that is, well, you know, size of the solar system or maybe 10 times bigger than a solar system, okay? So that, that kind of leads us up to a point where we're gonna, we're gonna you know, look, look back a little bit at history of astronomy and realize that astronomers have been seeing the tails on quasars for quite some time. I think um, the, first, you know, the first images that really showed these, these tails on quasars were taken back in, let's see, the 1918, okay? So way back, you know, we had you know, early images, that's not this particular one, but you know, they, they were, they were seeing, seeing these tails, right? And trying to figure out the mystery of what, what was going on with these quasars. For them to be this bright, okay, and to be this far away, we're, we're basically, we're left with one, basically one conclusion that then we're going to confirm that they must be black holes, okay? So quasars are black holes. And one thing that I'll mention in terms of numbers, if we think about the brightness and again, and how far away they are. So let's go back to this one here, okay? So they're so bright, there's, you know, they're, they're, 8, 8 billion light years away. We know that from the redshift, okay? So we know distance from Hubble's law. Quasars obey Hubble's law. 
And so then when we find out how bright they are at that incredible distance, we find out that some of them are, their total luminosity is corresponds to about 10 to the 14 star of our sun. Okay, so 10 to the 14 sun is the luminosity of these quasars. Okay, so they're, they are 10 or 100, so the trillion is 10 to the 12. So 10 to the 14 would be 100 trillion times brighter than our sun. Right? That's their actual energy output because luminosity is watts. Okay? It's actually joules per second. It's energy output. And so that gives you an idea about the, the sheer energy source. And again, that, that could be okay if you had, say, you know, 10 trillion stars and they're all a little bit brighter than our sun. Right? Maybe it was a, you know, a, a group of young, young stars. Right? Still, 10 trillion is a lot of stars considering that the, really the biggest, biggest galaxies we ever see are only about 2 trillion. Right? And again, after all, it's not 10 trillion, it's 100 trillion. So right away, you know, the idea that it's just a cluster of stars is already kind of problematic. But now that we find out that quasars are just a, a little bit bigger than a solar system in size, okay? Well, now, now that, that's a game changer. There has to be something fundamentally different about quasars. How could they possibly producing, be producing so much energy in such a small space? Well, yeah, you know, black holes, right? There's, no, uh, there's nothing else that can do that. All right? And we've talked about huge energy sources. You know, we talked about this idea that we can you know, have these, these gamma ray bursts from neutron stars colliding and small black holes colliding. But this is actually another scale of energy. Okay? And, it, and just to put it in perspective, this is also this, this, is this edge of astronomy. Right? Because although there are a few quasars that are only you know, two, maybe you know, two billion light years away, most of them are incredibly far. I mean, the, the, the universe itself is only thir- you know, you know, they fit 14 billion years old. Okay? And so we're looking back and we're seeing quasars that are 10 billion years old. And then they're, thus they're 10 billion light years away. And so when we're looking at such distant quasars, it is, it's, just, it's just remarkable that they're so bright. Okay? And now, how do, we, how do we confirm their black holes? Well, one thing is we compare it to the supermassive black hole we discovered in our own solar system. Okay? So compare to massive black hole in the Milky Way, okay? And when we do that, we, we, we say, okay, well, the one big, one big evidence of the supermassive black hole in the Milky Way is the gravitational behavior of stars around that black hole. And so we can see, we can see similar behavior. We can see blue shifts and red shifts of the gas that's swirling around a quasar, okay? Because again, we, there's no direct evidence of the black hole, okay? I mean, obviously with gravitational waves, maybe we can get there, but we're not there yet, okay? And so, so you know, our, our indirect evidence is the gravitational behavior of the gas around that proposed supermassive black hole in another galaxy, okay? All right, so, you know, that's, that's the idea here. We can see the gas moving at very high speed. By Kepler's third law, that must correspond to a mass that's huge, that, that you know, that is, you know, basically, let's see, um, that corresponds to a huge mass of, of, some, of stars, okay? Or just a huge amount of mass that could be explained by a black hole, all right? Um, and we can, we can actually see, you know, the, the disk, we can see the behavior of the accretion disk. We can actually see the disk around a quasar if we zoom in on a particular galaxy. And so then the question then is, okay, but black holes aren't known for being bright. You know, I mean, if we think of, if we think of black holes, if we think of the black hole in our own galaxy, it's not bright. We don't, we don't see a giant bright spot when, when we look towards the center of the galaxy, something that's so bright that it shines through the interstellar medium, right? Because, you know, basically a visible light is obscured in the direction of this, the center of the galaxy. And even when we look at x-rays, right, we don't, we don't see a, you know, an incredibly bright source coming from there. So, and furthermore, when we look at black holes in binary star systems, you know, other, other than, you know, kind of some accretion disk behavior, we don't, we don't see them as big bright spots, but we do see that accretion disk behavior. And that, that's the first clue is considering that we do, we do know that in binary star system, black holes have those accretion disks. And those accretion disks, sh- they shine. But why do they shine, right? Because it doesn't matter just fall across the event horizon and then we never see it again because no light can escape past the event horizon, right? When the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. Yes, that's true. But as it falls towards the event horizon, it speeds up. Kind of like the idea here of a, you know, a space probe falling into the atmosphere of Earth, right? It comes in at such great speed that it loses a bunch of energy to friction. That's what's happening with the accretion disk. There's a huge amount of friction occurring, and that friction causes a huge amount of light to be produced, very high energy light. 
And that's why these, these quasars actually shine so bright because of their accretion disks. Basically, the, the, all the matter swirling around the black hole as it falls in, okay? That's what shines. That's the, accretion, that's the energy source, is the accretion disk. It's not, it's not breaking the laws of physics and saying that the light comes from inside the black hole. No, it's just the light that's produced as things fall towards the event horizon, never to come back out, okay? So, and then, okay, so then, again, I said that our supermassive black hole doesn't have that, right? That's because we have a dormant quasar. Okay, at least that's, the, that's kind of the model that we look at. And we'll talk about why, why that's probably a, a pretty good model of the universe. So our galaxy definitely doesn't have that. We don't, we don't have this incredibly bright black hole at the center. We have a resting one. Your textbook calls it qu uh, quescent, okay? And this idea of a resting or dormant black hole, well, that means that maybe ours used to be active. And there actually is some evidence. Astronomers are studying some bulges these are bulges that were taken with a telescope and then superimposed on an image of the image of the Milky Way. Obviously, they weren't. There was no telescope outside the Milky Way looking in to take this take this picture. So this is a composition of actual kind of data of of super hot gas and the Milky Way. And this this these big bulges of hot gas go above and below the Milky Way out into the halo regions of the Milky Way. And it's thought that perhaps just a few million years ago, our black hole at the center of the galaxy was actively consuming matter and thus produced these bulges, right? So, you know, maybe, maybe that was the thing, you know, that not that long ago, the black hole at the center of our galaxy was active, okay? And it's, this is an active area of research, but it's definitely not active right now. It is definitely a dormant supermassive black hole. It's still there. It's still a supermassive black hole, but it's not, there is no superheated accretion disk around it that's producing a huge amount of light, okay? So then what about the jets, right? How does, how, do, how does the idea of jets, how does that jive, how is that consistent with a black hole, right? You know, we've kind of, we've kind of touched on this idea of pulsars having jets, so, you know, why, why would black holes have jets? And at such a huge scale that, that these jets that we see coming out of the quasars at the center of galaxies, they stretch out over hundreds of thousands of light years. So what's making these? Well, models and supercomputer super computations show that when you, when you look at the accretion disk, that the, the most likely direction of basically as the, as the heat energy is heated up and as, as particles are basically bounced away from the accretion disk, they tend to go perpendicular to the plane of the disk. And so the jets are more likely to form. And it, it's still not completely understood why they form, but at least there is a probabilistic argument to say that they, yeah, that they, if they're gonna form, they're gonna form perpendicular to the disk, and that's where we see, right? So at least there's not a big contradiction between the models and the observations, okay? But, but jets are still not completely understood, okay? Here's actually a picture of a jet. We can really see, we can see the accretion disk, and we can clearly see the jet. So, I mean, the, the, the evidence is that they're very common, they're out there, and they do match to some degree the models, but not quite, you know, like the strength of them, and, you know, the, is, is, still, is still little understood, okay? So, Big thing then, okay? We got quasars, they're ma super massive black holes. That's, that's fascinating, right? And they're so, they're, the, the fact that they produce so much energy, it just boggles the mind, okay? And we don't have one in our own galaxy. Now here's the thing. You know, I mentioned that there might've been one a couple, you know, a couple million years ago, Our, ours may have been active, but it may not have been as active as the ones we see because there's a variety of activity levels for one quasars. The very, very most active, and then, you know, then those, those and then even those, then maybe they'll, they'll become a little bit more dormant over time. Okay, over the, just a span of a few years, okay? So there's quite a lot of volatility there. Some are just burning super bright. Now that's the thing is, why is that? Well, they seem to be tied in with the very history of the universe. The idea is that if we look from time zero up to our current time of 3.8 billion years, we see a real correlation between quasar commonal like commonality and age. So early in the universe, there wasn't any quasars, and then they shot up, and they became very common. And then, you know, at a time of about one billion years after the Big Bang. And then after that, they've just been gradually becoming less and less common. And how do we know that? Well, we look at, we look at galaxies that are a certain distance away, and when we look at a galaxy that's, say, five billion light years away, that means we we're looking back in time five billion years. So, you know, that's the thing about astronomy. We're both stuck with look-back time, but we can also benefit from look-back time, okay? There's no way to look at something that's far away and not look back in time. Right? So indeed, we can look at galaxies at varying distances and see and take a collection of them and find that there's a strong correlation between how far they are away and how many of them have quasars. 
So close galaxies don't tend to have quasars. There's a few exceptions, but most close galaxies don't because they are all of our generation of galaxies. They're galaxies that are dormant. There's, they're, the, the bulge in the center of the galaxy is dormant. The, the, the supermassive black hole is dormant. Probably because it used up all the material that it had available to have that super hot accretion disk. Because eventually the accretion disk does fall over the event horizon, making the black hole even bigger, and that's it. There's nothing left to accrete. Okay? There can still be stars that are orbiting at high velocity, but if they're not close enough to experience some friction force or some tidal force, then they're never going to fall into the black hole. And so that black hole can't continue to consume matter. It can't continue to create energy through friction. Okay? And indeed, this other, this other graph here is showing that star formation matches up with the idea of the, the, how many, the relative number of quasars. So when there was a lot of star formation, a lot of activity early in the universe, there also were more active galactic centers. And by the way, active galactic center and quasar are basically synonyms. You know, so you can, you can talk about an active core of a galaxy that is a quasar. All of them seem to have black holes. There's a real connection between those terms. Uh, it wasn't so long ago in astronomy, 10, 15 years ago, where the terms were kind of separated because they weren't sure if all, if all active galactic centers were quasars or were black holes because quasars implied black holes. Now there's a lot more agreement on that so that you can really say those two terms are interchangeable. All right. And there's actually another fascinating correlation. And, and you know, besides just kind of the age of the universe and the, cha the changing of, of galaxies over the, over the many billion, billions of years since the Big Bang, there also seems to be this real strong connection between galaxy mass and quasar mass. And we see here that basically the mass of the central bulge, that's all the stars at the center of the galaxy, and the black hole mass that produces the accretion disk, that produces the quasar that we see, because the quasar is just the visible phenomenon that we see from Earth, right? The very bright, luminous phenomenon of the accretion disk of the black hole. Well, there's, that, there's a strong linear relationship between them. The bigger the bulge, the bigger the black hole. We're not sure why, but the data backs it up. This is the actual data. There's a strong linear correlation between how much, how, how much mass there is in the galaxy and how big the quasar is. And maybe, maybe it's just as simple as the idea that, you know, that there, if there's more mass, then there's, there's a greater likelihood of that mass falling into the quasar and thus you know, being, being bright and massive. All right? And here's, here's a picture of a quasar that is a, that's having a snack. Right? It's feeding on a star. Okay, because the star is close enough or the friction forces the tail of the star apart, and that's producing a huge amount of energy in the accretion disk. All right, here's the event horizon, the edge that you can never return past. Okay, so these supermassive black holes, bigger than, bigger than solar systems on the small size, the size of a solar system, also, often much, much bigger than a solar system, most luminous things in the universe. Okay, now here's the last question to leave you with How are they formed? Okay, well, one thing is they, they, can, they seem to be able to be kick-started when galaxies collide. Here's a galaxy with a couple of active um, galactic uh, centers, basically, basically quasars that aren't as dormant as ours, and the galaxies are colliding. The model suggests that as they collide, those quasars themselves will, kind of, will merge into one and then become a very bright active quasar, quasar again. And so that, that's one idea, that you know, galactic collisions stimulate the very brightest quasars. That makes sense. It definitely fits models and it can be, you know, computationally shown to, to, you know, to hold up. But then it begs the question, begs a very, very big question. Well, you know, one, one that I, I often come back to is, but how did, how did these quasars get seeded in the first place, right? Where did, where do they really start from, right? What's the, what's the seed black hole? Because calculations have shown that, yeah, okay, it makes sense. Once, once you have a quasar and you have a lot of available gas, then the quasar can just, you know, can burn really bright or its accretion disk can shine really bright and the black hole can get bigger and bigger. That, that definitely, definitely makes sense based on, you know, I think even the material which is in this class and makes sense to astronomers. But these black holes couldn't have started with the way that we talked about black holes starting so far, right? I mean, think about what, how we've learned about black holes. We learned that they, they start from the cores, the collapsed cores of supermassive stars, okay? The biggest stars in the main sequence, those, those bright or you know, bright blue or almost ultraviolet stars that only last a couple million years and then they blow up in a, in a, in a, you know, a type, type, uh, type one supermassive black or type two supermassive um, or supernova, excuse me. I keep saying supermassive because there's so many, right? But supernova and hypernova, right? So it blows up and then the core collapses and the, the you know, neutron degeneracy can't hold it back and it collapses into a black hole. Okay, so that, that's great. That's how we can think about black holes forming. And then they, they might show up because they're in a binary star system. Or they might show up because they collide with another black hole and we see the gravitational waves created. But none of that explains the black holes that form these huge ones, these quasars. Because 
the seed black hole would have had to have a mass of 2,000 times the mass of the sun. Well, no, super, no giant star has ever been calculated. There's no model that says that stars could ever have been as big as 2,000 times the mass of the sun, maybe 300. And that, that's like modern astronomy, like pushing the limits, because really the, the, the limit for years was 150 times the mass of the sun. So maybe, maybe the first stars that formed after the Big Bang were 300 times bigger than the mass of the sun. But there's no way that they then could have formed black holes that were 2,000 times bigger. So was it, was it all collisions of early black holes? What seeded the first black holes that then eventually became quasars at the center of galaxies? How were they created? And astronomers have actually found quasars that, are, that exist only 700 million years after the Big Bang. So they formed very early in the universe. But how, right? And these are just some of these questions about like how the, the groundwork, the basic starting conditions in the universe, they're such fascinating questions. And quasars are certainly part of that mystery. And astronomers don't currently know because it is so hard to look back to the very beginning of everything, as you would imagine. But we're actually going to start, start talking about the very beginning of everything in the following chapters. So I hope this, this chapter on quasars, basically the supermassive black holes at the centers of distant galaxies, previous types of galaxies that existed before our current generation of galaxies, I hope that this has been an interesting lecture and I hope to talk to you all soon.